Hey brother Hear me now Brother dog Know me Understand Welcome to the Sargassum Podcast. My name is Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francisca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. We're going to share with you the latest ideas and solutions about sargassum, which has become an international challenge. So, good morning, everyone. How are you? I'm doing well. How about you guys? All good. Good morning. Fine. Good morning. I, I'm good, but this weekend I was I was getting really depressed a bit. Um, I was reading um, the climate reality check from 2020, and it pretty much said we don't have any carbon budget left um, if we want to reach two degrees Celsius of warming. And I didn't know it was that bad. I knew it was worse than the IPCC, but I didn't know it was that bad. And then on top of reading that, I had this conversation with other climate activists who are scientists. And one person said we should stop fighting for 1.5 degrees of warming um, because it's very unlikely that we will get there. He said something about 1%. He read somewhere in a study. And yeah, that made me really depressed and sad and anxious and worried that maybe it isn't possible to do so. But of course, I, I still want to fight for it because 1.5 degrees is really important target and fighting for two degrees isn't really an option because maybe we already go over tipping points by two degrees and Fighting for two may be the same as fighting for four or six degrees because nature will go its course and, and make that happen if we go over those tipping points. Yeah, I was actually actually listening to uh, the podcast that you recommended to me, Outrage and Optimism. And I was also a little bit depressed uh, at the beginning because they were interviewing uh, Johann Strom. And he said that basically from the 15 tipping points that we have identified that might happen due to climate change, three of them have already happened. That's the Arctic sea ice. And actually this winter, uh, sea ice didn't form in many parts of the Arctic. Um, it was coral reefs, of course, and it was the Antarctic uh, ice shelf. So they're already over the tipping point. And at that stage, I was also like, holy Christ. But then listening to that podcast always brings me up again because um, Christiana Figueres is always it's a hardcore optimist and she really thinks that we can still do this. And yeah, so I, my faith came back a bit that uh, we can still aim for the 1.5 degree, but I can feel you. It goes up and down. What about you, Robbie? Any ups and downs on climate or you, Cleo? <clears throat> Well, um, Francisca and I was speaking earlier this week, and she said climate emergency to me. And um, I, I don't really think that's a good term. We, we disagreed on that. You know, um, we, are in a, in a, we are in an emergency situation, but I, I think we, I mean, it's, we're, in a, we're in the midst of a catastrophe, you know. Um, things have already started happening. Like when we were talking earlier about how much rain we've had here in the Carolinas, this year, you know, it's, it's been crazy. You know, we, we, these storms, these hurricanes are just so full of water because of all this water vapor. Just a little bit of, of you know, a half a degree of warming increased a lot of water vapor in there, and that's got to come out of the sky somewhere. And um, and we've been getting a lot of it here from from the hurricanes. And and, and look at what happened to uh, Nicaragua, two back to back, Nicaragua and uh, and uh, San Andres, Colombia. And then it just came right up Mesoamerica, and and it's you know we, we had a, a crazy number of storms, and I, I I think you know we're 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 in a catastrophe. It's a climate change catastrophe. It's not, um, and I, I agree it's not you know, or I hope it's not beyond the you know t some of these tipping points we talk about, but we're already in a catastrophic situation. Look what's you know look what this this winter storm we're having here. I mean, the reason that. Um, you know, there's millions of people out of electricity just in Texas alone. And the reason is they never prepare for weather like this. They never, they have never prepared for a storm event like this because 
they rarely get this kind of weather, but we're getting this kind of weather regularly now. Oh, these thousand year storm events. So these thousand year storm events are happening every year now. And, and, and for me, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a catastrophe. The storm is not a catastrophe. I mean, it, it's, with you know, in and of itself, I mean, it, it could be, but the thing about it is it, all these hurricanes, we had five hurricanes hit the Gulf Coast. We had these two hurricanes I was just talking about. I mean, we're, we're in a, we're in a, we're in the midst of a catastrophe today and we need to start talking about it and fixing it so that we can start correcting these things rapidly exactly you know we need to start know. talking about what are we going to do about it i fully agree no. with that. and <laughs> what are we not, not what are we going to do about it tomorrow what are we going to do about it today exactly fully agree with that and i think our two guests of today will give us um, some hints in that uh, direction so it's my pleasure today to introduce you to Jason Cole and Jorge Vega Matos from the company C Combinator. Um, C Combinator is a public benefit corporation partnering with companies and institutions to research and develop seaweed into productive and innovative products, starting with biostimulants and natural fertilizers. So Jason is the EVP for innovation and he obtained a PhD from the University of Northern Colorado in Educational Instructional Technology and brings his knowledge about learning um, psychology and theory to the software environment. As an experienced technology executive, he has an excellent track record in business and product development. And we are super happy that his innovative spirit brought him to the field of marine permaculture, where he wants to tackle climate change with Sea Combinator. Then we have Jorge Vega Matos. He's the VP of Marketing and Communications and Program Director for Puerto Rico and Mexico at Sea Combinator. And he will give us some insights into their plan to turn the problematic of sargassum's explosions into valuable and innovative derivatives that can unleash a whole new economic paradigm in the Caribbean. And so welcome both of you to our podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, so we ask all our guests the same question, and I want to ask the same question to both of you. And that question is, what is sargassum to you? So um, I, this is Jason. I think I'll, 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 I'll take that first. Um, to me, the sargassum is a, is a harbinger. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a sign, and it's a sign of disrupted ocean ecosystems. Um, you know, the, the sargassum belt that we're seeing in, in the Atlantic, um, and we're even now talking to some people in Tanzania where they're, they're having an equal sargassum bloom um, that, that's, coming, that's coming ashore then. To me, it's a sign that, that the oceans are fundamentally disrupted, and, there's the, and there's, so there's a new niche, right? There's a new niche that's emerged. Um, and so if sargassum is a harbinger, it's up to us what we do with that message. Uh, you know, so it's, for us, it's a, it's a, it's a goad, it's a signal, uh, you know, and so do we ignore it? You know, do we, do we let the kind of hopelessness overwhelm us or do we try to do something positive and try to restore the balance uh, while making a larger climate, climate impact? Right. Um, yeah, following uh, what Jason said, definitely sargassum is, is a sensor. Nature is always the best sensor for what's happening in nature. Uh, including ourselves. We are part of nature. We are part of this ecology. Um, so it's certainly specifically in the Caribbean, uh, it, it, it's already signaling everything that's happening, all the different phenomena that are happening, not just in the ecological world, but also economic. Um, um, so it is, it is an useful signal. Uh, the blooms themselves are, are proof of what algae can do, how adaptive sargassum is. Um, and so I also take it on a more positive side, which is this is nature telling us that under these new circumstances, there's something that grows, that thrives, uh, and, and something that adapts, basically, in the same way that we have to adapt as well. So it is, it, sargassum is a symbol for, for the importance of the oceans and, and how we can work with the oceans to avert uh, climate collapse, you know, which we're, we were talking about terms. Uh, I also use uh, the term mostly climate collapse, uh, and not just in a negative way, uh, also in the positive way meaning that there are a lot of things that need to collapse in order for them to be regenerated on you. Nice, interesting. Um, so let me ask you another question at all. So, so 
I, I was unaware that these kind of beaching, so I guess the beaching events were happening in East Africa. Is it? Is are they having a lot of stuff going on there? Yeah. So uh, the the yeah. So the, the it's he, it's actually hitting both sides of the continent, right? So obviously the the Atlantic Belt is hitting in the in the in the west, where you know, we're talking to some folks in Senegal and um, Nigeria, you know, about beachings there. Um, and what you know, and we we. We'd, I'd, I've read some news reports about some some potential beachings, you know, some some e expanding beachings in in Southeast Asia. But the yeah the, the but we were talking to some um, to some folks at the UN, um, and uh, they were talking about the impact that it was having in Tanzania as well. So so yeah, it's it's definitely an emerging global phenomenon. Um, so. The, well, only Tanzania, or like Tanzania, Kenya, or all of East Africa. Or you know, I, 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 we've, we've just this just a thread that we've just heard about that we're just starting to to, to pull on and unravel. Um, yeah, so I, I, I can say I can say Tanzania with certainty. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm sure I'm sure if it's hitting Tanzania, you're it's it's hitting it's got to be hitting Madagascar. It's got to be hitting in Kenya. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, well, well. Thank you for sharing that with me. That's 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 stuff we certainly learned brand new today, and uh, we appreciate that. Um, but t tell us a bit about what um, C Combinator's mission is and, and what you guys are doing. Right. Um, so the our our mission, our stated mission, is to help restore the the health of the oceans and climate through the growth of naturally occurring seaweeds. Uh, we are a public benefit corporation, so we take that quite seriously because we are legally mandated uh, to follow this goal and to achieve this goal. Um, how, how are we doing it? So we are basically opening the first uh, high-tech biorefinery uh, for, for macroalgae in, in the Caribbean. Uh, we're gonna be based in Puerto Rico, but we're also gonna be having high derivative hubs in Mexico and other parts, uh, other parts of the Caribbean basin. Um, and Essentially, you know, uh, when we're talking about sargassum and where we are a pioneer company, there are, there are a lot of groups looking at specifically in the Caribbean, but what makes us uh, potentially unique or what makes us excited about our work and our approach is that we are bringing that mission to life and we feel like we can bring that mission to life um, by, by dealing with the sargassum emergency in, in a way that, that flips the equation, right? So... That means that uh, we are looking to innovate the hell of sargassum. We are looking to scale it commercially uh, across many different industries and many essential industries. And we'll talk a little bit more about why those industries. Um, and we're doing it in a way that's looking to minimize waste, in a way that's looking to develop new kinds of economies. Um, and so really we're thinking about it in terms of a system, uh, you know, which is why for such a big problem as sargassum locally, but also climate collapse globally, we need to be thinking about systems and not just one vertical, one business. No, it really is a system that we're trying to create in order to support that mission. Um, nice. Yeah, and I guess, you know, we, we were talking, we were talking about why the Caribbean and, and maybe this is personal for me, I'm from Puerto Rico. Uh, I've seen already uh, through Hurricane Maria, for example, uh, just how we are at the forefront of that. So, you know, part of that mission all, also, it's not just, we're not just commercially innovating, right? It's, there's no, there's no business on a dead planet. Um, so ultimately, and not just because we're a public benefit corporation, but because everybody in our team has had a personal stake in seeing the effects of climate collapse. We know that we're ultimately about economic justice and, and especially for island and coastal economies, you know, more than half, uh, way more than half of the food that we consume on the whole planet is basically created in very specific latitudes, basically the tropics or the subtropics, and many of them within 100 miles of the coast. So coasts are civilization, and especially in the tropics, uh, they are the ones that are uh, facing the wrath of climate volatility first. Mm -hmm. So we also see it as a sort of, of economic and social justice project, uh, because we are trying to we are trying to reverse the trends of how historically uh, island and coastal nations uh, have been. They are places of innovation uh, uh, and not of exploitation as they historically been treated. So yeah, that's how our mission comes to life. Now, where, where in Mexico are you planning to work? 
we're going to be in Quintana Roo, uh, right in the epicenter uh, uh, of Puerto of Morelos. Sarcasm. Yeah, we're going to we're in Puerto Morelos, uh, okay. and we are our team is uh, currently collecting all along that shore. Uh, right, I mean it is a peninsula, and the natural shape of that peninsula is just getting the onslaught off. So our team on the ground already has uh, an established collection operation, working with the governments, working with. Uh, local hotels and property owners to just pick up most of the sargassum that's coming on that side. Yeah, there's a lot of people on my descent uh, in Quintana Roo and in Yucatan up in Mary. They're doing some amazing things with uh, with sargassum. They're making soaps and fertilizers and papers and stuff. And uh, for sargassum, you're right in the middle of a lot of really amazing innovation that's going on. So thank you for going being there. Jason, would you like to add something more about description of the project or? I think, I think Jorge's definitely covered the mission. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, he, he's, he's definitely uh, that, uh, hit that one. So I have a question. The Climate Foundation led by Dr. Brian von Erzen has spent 10 years doing research and development on how to grow seaweed profitable and at scale before a sea combinator was born to com commercialize their findings at full scale. So what are the biggest hurdles that seaweed farming projects have to overcome to be profitable at scale? That's a great question. Um, yeah, and, and we were spun out of the, 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 the Climate Foundation, uh, you know, to, you know, and, and our, our first the, the first area is one of the first areas we were looking at uh, was, you know, scaling marine permaculture um, as we were also investigating, you know, what we could do with the sargassum. Uh, so our, our focus now, though, is, is we're really focused on the sargassum now, um, you know, and we've, and we've got the, we have the marine permaculture ticking over, but we've got plenty of, of seaweed to, to work with right now. Um, but, but to get to your question, the, the, the hurdles to seaweed farming project at scale. I think we, all, we also need to distinguish where the far, where the farming project is, right? Whether it's near shore or it's, or it's kind of the deep water systems that, that are envisioned by the Climate Foundation. So the one of the great things about about being in this business is that is that there's this especially in Europe there's this growing and emerging seaweed community. You know that uh, you know, and so I've been able to talk to you know seaweed farmers, you know people who actually ha are growing seaweed in the water. I've been able to to talk to people who are developing projects, people who are developing the technologies around it, um, you know, and, and really start to you know kind of understand it. But I, I think for uh, you know, so I think on the on the, the the technology that we have now for for growing you know nearer nearer to the shore, the biggest hurdle is regulatory, right? So the biggest hurdles are are, are actually getting the permission to put lines in the water. Once you've got that permission, then actually it's relatively straightforward right now anyway, to grow, you know, to have a sustainable farm, even 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 that, you know, scales under a hectare. Um, so really what, as an industry, I think we, you know, there's, there has to be this push to, to, to create some, some guidelines to help regulators understand, right? And to help like, you know, and to help kind of guide, the, guide and shape the industry because there's enormous potential you know, just, just in our shorelines, you know, just, just where we, where we know how to plant, you know, with long line, you know, you know plant long lines or plant cages, um, you know, for, you know, to, to grow, to grow seaweeds. And even there we start, you know, restoring ecosystems and restoring ocean health. Um, you know, so, so if we can make it easier, you know, it doesn't take a two year process to be able to, you know, put, you know, an acre of, an acre of lines in the water, um, then that would, I think that, that if we could, if you can clear that barrier, then that opens up, that'll open up an enormous industry and you'll just see huge growth and huge potential there. Um, and then longer term, you know, we see there's huge potential in the deep water seaweed farming, right? Uh, and that's, you know, but, you know we, we definitely have that roadmap that we're looking at. Um, and so, you know, and restoring the oceans and pulling all the carbon that we've put in, um, you know, put into the ocean, pulling all that out is going to take huge amounts of marine infrastructure. Um, and so, and so we're, we're working with, a, you know, multiple partners to develop the technology and the techniques, you know, to take what the Climate Foundation has started and, and try to move that up to scale. 
Yeah, for people that doesn't know about um, seaweed farming, like, could you explain better what is your project with the uh, sargassum in, like, as you said, close to the shore or in uh, deep sea? Like, and you you talk about lines and could, could oh. you explain better like the <laughs> so, phenomenon so, so, of uh, yeah farming? yeah yeah. So we're, we're not actually a sea company right now is not actually growing growing yeah, yeah. seaweed right right. So we're not we're we're just we're, we're dealing with the rafts that are the naturally occurring the naturally occurring rafts, you know, that, that have that have crept up in the last 10 years of sargassum. Um, but most seaweed, most seaweed is grown on on long ropes that are anchored to the anchored to the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the ocean, um, you know, in, in relatively shallow water. Um, and so the lines are seeded, you know, the, you, you bring the line on shore, you wrap a seed line around it, you you, you hang it out in the water, you let the seaweed grow. Um, you know, you occasionally go through and make sure you know nothing's eating it that you don't want to be eating it. You know, and then you, you you harvest it, dry it, and 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 sell it on. Um, you know, and there are probably what five or six well understood commercialized species. Uh, you know, for a variety of different uh, locales here uh, here in uh, in England, we tend to grow a a, a long kelp. Um, you know, uh, that's that's more more cold water. Uh, in the tropics, they'll they'll tend to grow more of a red seaweed. Um, you know, to produce carrageenan. But yeah, there's a huge range of you know, the, I mean, so. So not you know there is a range of currently commercialized species, but you know the 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 potential range is you know a hundred times greater than, than than we've we've looked at so far. So so th there's a huge amount of of space, a huge amount of operating room in this space still. And especially those oil companies that are not going to be needing their offshore structures, you know, just pass them on. We'll make something. Yeah, yeah, better. yeah. We'll, we'll we'll find something interesting to do with them. That's fine. <laughs> I like catching fish around those uh, rigs. And, uh, you know, there's a, a huge seaweed farm in southern Belize uh, on the Placencia Peninsula down there. I don't know whether you guys know. You know there's a, there's a, a, actually a seaweed growers cooperative working together down there. They got a really nice project going on. I, I, but I think they're selling their product to uh, Asia. Yeah, uh, no, most of the... Actually, so, so, so Chile and... Um, Chile also grows a huge amount of, of seaweed, and but all of it gets basically dried and sold, sold to, to, to China. Um, so one of the products that we work with, it's uh, alginate, right? It's the it's a complex sugar from from the brown seaweeds. Um, and it used to be that you know there were alginate factories, um, you know, in in the U.S. and in Europe, and now there's most of the world. There's now there's there's one alginate factory in Europe. Um, and then most of it's produced in China, um, but the Chinese are actually starting to feel the impact, their own impacts of climate change, and that their own seaweed harvests are starting to fall because the waters are warming too much. Um, mm. So now they're having to buy buy their their seaweed from from Chile. Interesting, very interesting. Um, Jason, when I was looking up your LinkedIn profile, <laughs> I had two questions. First was, okay, he did a lot of schooling in um, education and IT, like really specialized in IT. How does somebody like that become interested in marine permaculture? And my other question was, what is an EVP? Like, what is your role at Sea Combinator? Okay, yeah, so, um, so yeah. It, it, it's it, it's been an interesting an interesting journey, but I mean, and, and the short answer is I was I was tired of making the lights blink in the right order, um, you know, which basically in IT that's what you do is you make sure the lights blink in the right order on the on the computers. Um, but yeah, so but I, I but I really see this as an extension of 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 kind of like my whole earlier work and everything. I mean, I it's a cliche I know, but you know I've I was as a teenager I was inspired by the work of Buckminster Fuller. Um, you know, I, I still I still have a quote from from Bucky in my personal email. You know, we're called to be the architects of the future, not its victims. Um, so, um, and I've been an environmentalist, you know, my my, my whole life. And actually, the, my work in ed tech was an extension of my work, uh, my thinking and work as in the environmental field, um, because what I saw was too much of the environmental thought was fighting a rear guard action. Right? It's like trying to trying to like keep things from being torn apart. Um, and I wanted to see if we could do something to get out in front and 
help create positive momentum. I thought education would be a way to do that. Um, you know, I mean, you know, cause you know, I, 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 cause this was back in the, well, I'm going to date myself here, but this was back in the early nineties. I was, you know, my, I was actually installing solar, solar electric systems, you know, on, on houses and, you know, that was my day job. And, you know, and, while I was going through school, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and I realized like, like, we're just like, we weren't moving fast enough. So I figured a larger group of educated people would help. And of course, um, Bucky wrote an, an essay, uh, Education Automation. And if you want to understand the internet um, as seen from, you know, 1964, um, I strongly recommend you read that because <laughs> he had this vision of individualized education supported by technology. He, you know, imagine, a, um, you know, a, you know, individual broadcast to everybody's house, uh, you know, the best education in the world. Uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's basically it's it's, it's even you know, he, he envisioned edX and took it further. Um, so yeah, so that's where I started my career, and I really worked at the intersection of education and open source software. Um, you know, and I had a lot of roles, and I included running a business, which is actually sort of where where my kind of you know where I, it enabled me to make that leap. Um, yeah, because a few years ago, I, I was actually a few years ago, I was actually pretty burned out, uh, and I had the opportunity to take a little mini retirement. Um, so I helped run a hydroponic lettuce farm, um, and, uh, I wrote a novel, um, which is coming out in a couple months, um, uh, blatant plug, um, <laughs> in, uh, you know, and so then in doing the farming and in researching the novel, I kind of got back in touch with my desire to let, help alter the physical world rather than, you know, writing another app. Uh, so I used, used, I used my, my, decided to use my powers for good and, I you know, started uh, a project of, of teaching myself a, a new field. Um, and then, you know, I really want to do something around climate change, found marine permaculture through Project Drawdown. Um, and I reached out to, you know, as a New Englander, you know, the, the Woods Hole Connection really, really spoke to me. Um, so I reached out to, to Brian and volunteered. Um, and I was, you know, volunteering with uh, Climate Foundation. And then when C Combinator rolled out, <clears throat> yeah, I used my background in business. Yeah, I thought my, my background in business and tech innovation would be would be useful um you know because really what i what i mean my role is for executive vice president for innovation that's what the evp stands for um is really about helping really smart technical people create cool stuff right my job is to like like point them in a direction uh, you know and then when they get distracted by shiny things point them back in that direction um and then provide them with and slide pizza to the door really I mean, that's, that's, that's my job. Um, you know, so, so, and really I'm, I'm able to, so I was able to do that with computer programmers and now I'm able to do it with chemists and nobody hasn't, nobody seems to have noticed I don't have a degree in chemistry. So um, we just won't, we won't tell them that. Uh, but yeah, that, that's what I do is, is uh, provide air cover and slide pizza under doors. Nice. I, I think if you were studying in Greeley, that wasn't latest you were doing hydroponics, right? And, um, uh, that was way before that. <laughs> and, um, let us know. Let, let us I did know have a roommate you're... who actually built a hundred, little hydroponic farm in his closet. <laughs> yeah, nice. To that. <laughs> nice. Um, let us know whenever you, your book comes out and send us some links to it. And we'll, we'll try and promote it a little bit for you. I appreciate for you, man. it. That's, thank, you. No, thank you for being here today. Or thank both of you. But we'll thank you again in a little bit. All right. <laughs> yeah, definitely super interesting trajectory. And I'm actually um, really happy that from, let's say, all the paths you could have taken to save the world, so to say, with your environmentalist heart, you decided to go for seaweed, right? And um, so my question to both of you is, okay, we know that seaweed is the future. So can you tell us why do they have such a huge potential, and especially sargassum, why do you think this is the way to go? Oh, I can take that. And, and you know, the, the transition from what uh, Jason uh, is. Jason and I actually met at a science fiction uh, economics conference. Shout out to the Edge Writers Network in Europe for putting such an amazing event. Um, I, my own background is uh, basically as a commercial anthropologist and, and foresight um, researcher. So I was basically helping being the, the capitalist mercenary that was helping kind of large organizations, well, not just commercial organizations, but large organizations understand the future. And that's how Jason and I originally connected, which is very, very uh, interesting because our concept of the future and how we see the potential uh, of, of seaweed, it's really encapsulated by 
by knowing that we're actually just, so seaweed is just one uh, of, let's say the many organisms that we are kind of rediscovering or even discovering for the first time. There's a movement, you know, that includes mushroom, fungi, lichens, um, all organisms that now we understand play a key role in maintaining uh, the balance and health of ecosystems, um, precisely because they are so obscure and have such unique uh, bio biochemical properties. You know, I mean, they're, they are very humble organisms. They're very resilient. Uh, for a long time, they've been disregarded as weird, boring, dangerous, slimy, ugly. And now some of them are understood, for example, to be, uh, you know, in some cases, the, the nervous system for like old forests. Uh, so it's amazing. And we do seaweed, you know, what we're doing with seaweed, we know that we're a larger part of this environmental movement that's trying to rediscover these organisms. So, uh, you know, generally speaking, the potential for seaweed and, and, uh, and, and it, it's uniquely futuristic. You know, the, it, it is emblematic of the age that we are entering. You know, we're in an age where we're talking about a biomimicry, biodesign, bioengineering, where, you know, we're not currently living through an age of mutation, of nature potentially run amok or nature surprising us in such a way that it tells us that it's, it cannot really be guided by human priorities anymore. And so seaweed as a philosophy uh, definitely makes us reconsider notions of what our raw material is. They don't need land. Uh, they don't need additional water. They only need the sun. They use whatever nutrients they can find and then they grow like crazy. Uh, in some cases, you know, seaweeds are some of the fastest growing plants in the whole world. Um, so, when we see that and when we see the unique properties that they have, like they are natural hormones, uh, they are antiseptic, they mimic certain types of muscle tissue, uh, they are bioenhancers, they store energy in a particular way. Um, I mean, that's futuristic as F, you know, it, and it's very, very exciting because for us, it means that we're not just discovering seaweed, we're discovering a completely new um, range of approaches to science, to processing, to design in order to be able to tap into these amazing properties that have a lot of, you know, have a wide range of uses in industries like pharmaceutical, medicine, cosmetics, agriculture, fashion, even energy regeneration. So, I mean, uh, yeah, algae is futuristic, that, that's it. And they even sequester carbon, so what else do we want? Okay. <laughs> no, it's, well, you can't say futuristic and not embrace the future. Uh, I think Will I Am said that. And uh, um, but if if you were to um, understate my particular project, I, I would say that I'm uh, our project is trying to protect biocultural diversity. And um, so my question is, who are your working partners in the Caribbean? You know, which communities? And I hope you're going to say indigenous somewhere. Which indigenous communities will profit profit from uh, the, the research you're doing there? Right. Okay. Well, let me let me get you. It's uh, personally uh, because I'm also an artist and artist curator here in Berlin. A lot of my personal work has been on around marginalized identities and marginalized communities, and I've tried to unite that in the economic sense. So I completely agree with you, and I think the whole company understands this larger idea of ecology. Uh, you know, that we need, a, let's call it, an, and I think that the, the term that's being used a lot by people that I admire is we're a multi-species civilization and we're not going to make it as a civilization if we don't see it that way. Uh, there's a quote from an amazing book uh, by Robin Wall Kimmer uh, called Braying Sweetgrass uh, that where she they talk about indigenous wisdom and scientific knowledge because it is scientific knowledge uh, um, that has been created and maintained by a lot of these indigenous or origin, originary uh, societies around the world. Uh, and it says, uh, I think the quote is, the, the, the term for, uh, she was saying, you know, what is in a lot of native, um, in a lot of native cultures, the word for plant, it's usually associated to a sort of caretaker. You know, those who take care of us, I believe, uh, they, they defined it as. So when we look at what we're doing and how we're partnering, I think like that's very central to our tenet is that we are obviously a commercial entity, but given the very specific emergency uh, of sargassum in the Caribbean, 
and a larger global emergency around climate collapse, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're not just a company. We have to be advocates. We have to be activists. We have to be supporters. We have to be researchers. And, and so that means a wide range of partners. Uh, obviously, it starts with the communities, you know, and, and uh, being from Puerto Rico, being from the beaches that I have seen already being affected by climate change. Um, ultimately, it has to come to helping those communities. Uh, just obviously through jobs and in the communities that we are, we are employing people and we have that, impact, that direct economic impact, but also by, by we bring value by mitigating the negative effects of sargassum. Um, in Puerto Rico, that means fishermen communities that have been greatly affected uh, in both Puerto Rico, but also mostly in Mexico is a tourism industry, which employs so much people. Um, so we, we have that economic impact, direct economic impact. Um, I, I feel also that there is something that you said about sort of the culture around and understanding what culture means is that beaches and the ocean will never just be a place for resource extraction or exploitation. They are cultural in Asia. In those beaches is where parents teach their kids how to swim for the first time. In those beaches is where people fall in love. In those places is where people maintain kind of like their religious practices. You know, the ocean is an entity, a very deep personal identity because ultimately we come from the ocean. And, you know, as a species, we have to understand that, that we are just one of the many species there. So I feel like we understand that our, our impact has to be defined in a much more larger scale than what commercially arrives. And does the partners that we are partnering with, which are researchers, et cetera, uh, also include potentially artists, includes people that are trying to understand what are the different aspects of the ocean that we have to maintain. Um, but continuing on, um, we are a scientific organization first and foremost. So obviously we have a lot of uh, academic and scientific uh, partners in Puerto Rico, some of the major universities and also in Mexico with perhaps uh, exploring opportunities with the main agricultural and science uh, universities in Mexico as well. Um, it also with the governments, you know, I mean, I think the sargassum problem has been so serious because a lot of governments don't have the resources to deal with the sudden onslaught of tons and tons, megatons of sargassum coming to their shore. So now we're, we're a real partner because we can tell them there's more, there's more than two options, which is leave it to the beach to rot or take it further inland where it's still going to be toxic and where some of those toxins might seep into the groundwater. For example, something that happens in Quintana Roo and that's affecting a lot of the um, uh, indigenous Maya communities and just the general population there is that the, the aquifers in Quintana Roo are being affected, not just by human contamination, but by a lot of the things that are taken uh, into landfills further inland. It's going into the beautiful cenotes that are part, uh, important part of, of the water supply, but also an important cultural aspect of Quintana Roo. Uh, so we're very, very clear that, you know, like we are trying to be a valuable partner for that. Um, yeah, and I think that that's it. I think that the summary is that we know that we wear many hats and we are very, very ambitious with the sorts of people and institutions that we are partnering with, not just as a commercial institution, but again, as an activist uh, institution as well. Yeah, um, man, that's a great answer. <laughs> that's a great answer. Um, but getting back to sargassum, why mm -hmm. do you think sargassum is one of an algae that has so much potential you said there's hundreds of algae out there so why did you choose to go for sargassum I don't, now that we chose sargassum i think sargassum shows us um the uh <laughs> you, you, and, and and really because because it's a because it was there because it was such a problem because it's so large um, it was just some of them we were thinking about seaweed, um, you know, and thinking about what we were going to do. Um, it was, you know, and then we, and when we started digging into it, the potential just became, became obvious to us. Um, so we, we, we just, we just, we've just been kind of continuing down that rabbit hole, you know. Um, you know, originally the, uh, we were, we've been, we were kind of like looking back over the last year, you know, our original roadmap was we were going to make a, a biostimulant uh, and, and compost, um, and that was it. That was that was our entire product roadmap. <laughs> now it's a uh, it's a little bit more than that. Um, yeah, but I can I can get into you know um, you know. So now what we've realized is that we can like the range of applications when you begin to understand it right and begin to like kind of 
kind of work with work with the weed, right? And and um, I, I use this idea of um, of eolithism, right? It's like designing with what you find with what you find, right? So so how do you how do you take what 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 nature is giving you, uh, and 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 find find those leverage points, find those keys, uh, and and do something really really interesting and really really cool. So. You know, so yes, we're we're still producing a biostimulant, and and we're and it's we're 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 really really excited about it. We're we're running a, actually we're running a, a trial right now in Tabasco with cacao farm with the cacao farmers, um, you know, and we're we're running trials in India uh, with subsistence farmers. Um, the sar because of the sargassum, there's so much of it, um, and and the processing technology that we've 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 kind of put together is relatively inexpensive. We can go to these you can go to these communities that. Typically, haven't had access to it, and 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 give them a product that will help improve their yields and help improve their soils. Um, and so then we started working. Okay, we have the biostimulant, and now but we have, you know, most of most of the sargassum is still left. Um, so we started working with it, and the, the chemistry is a little tricky. The chemistry is a little interesting. It's a it's a it is a stubborn beast, and it does not give up its secrets easily. Uh, but once you once you get it, um, there is there's there's lots of potential under there. So we've made. Um, you know, so we've made we've made some really interesting products. Uh, you know, so uh, we've made a, a super absorber for agriculture that we think will help keep water on the field um, and, and potentially improve nutrient use, right? So you don't have to put as much nitrogen fertilizer on, um, you know, because it'll keep the fertilizer on the field as well. Uh, we have replacements for for leather. We have uh, foam. Uh, you know, we have a roadmap that extends out. You know, that, that you know that I can I can talk about, um, but. But yeah, so once you start to understand, once you start to kind of play with the sargassum and start to understand it, you know, and 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 um, that yeah, the, the the potential is just is just huge. That's really cool. That's a lot of products I've never heard about. Can you maybe explain to us more what this biostimulant does, like as a yes. product? Yeah. So so the biostimulant is actually it's a it's a it's a pretty comp it's a complex mix of like sugars and plant hormones and proteins and and we're, we're blending it with a few other with a few other organic inputs just to kind of like get a full a full package but really what it does is it is it kind of it kind of um it, it helps the plant use nutrients more efficiently and also provides some potential for to resist um, um like heat or drought uh you know um and 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 uh, you know, improve its yields because it's it's a little bit more, a little bit more robust. Um, you know, so so what we're what we're looking at is okay. How does how does the seaweed extract provide, um, you know, provides uh, signals to the plant uh, that will you know that will encourage the plant to like say be ready for a heat event, um, or how does it you know provide, um, you know, how does it uh, impact the soil to you know make make fertilize you know make nutrients that are in the soil more readily available um or you know uh, so so there's there's a range of there's a range of uh potential impacts that 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 it can have um you know we're looking you know we, we've we've got some we have some data that you know that we can improve we can improve yields you know, across a, a variety of a variety of crops um you know and we're and we're we're, we're continuing those those field trials as well Cool. And um, you you're talking about projects that you you have in mind, like uh, this one. But are you planning to uh, to produce uh, to do other projects uh, out of Sargassum? Like, uh, which is the main project you are planning to do? Right. Right. I I'll I'll, I'll preface by that, and I'll let Jason, who's our our portfolio master, uh, speak out specifics. But I think that before that, it's very important. Um, since we're talking about systems, to understand well what kind of system we are and what kind of system we're not. Um, and so I have to say that the whole team is very excited about one vision, which is that C Combinator wants to be the anti-oil company. Um, meaning, you know, oil companies are incrementally toxic from, from extraction to waste. They get CO2 that's been trapped for millions, if not billions of years, or millions. Um, turns it into CO2, that fuels industries that generate more CO2 and more toxicity. And then when it's disposed, it kills everything. It's even more toxic. It leaves microplastics. Uh, 
you know, that have been found in anything from the food that we eat to even newborn babies, as sad as it is to, to understand. So we want to be the opposite from that. And what that means is that we can extract and we can refine seaweed by minimizing, if not outright avoiding in some cases, turning that biomass back into CO2. Uh, we're replacing then the products and the, uh, that, that emit CO2 or that uh, seep out toxicity. Uh, and then the products that we create like the biostimulant, uh, which are also in, in many cases soil res uh, restorers, uh, they actually increase the, the carbon capacity or, or the, uh, the ability of soil, of natural soil, including agricultural soil to suck carbon in. So we don't generate CO2 actually, the more successful that we are, the less CO2 there should be. Uh, across and, and we're very excited about that and that reflects in our product portfolio which Jason can can explain yeah so, go ahead yeah I was gonna say so, so if, if we if we use the anti-oil company analogy um, I'm responsible for the refinery so I guess that's, uh, <laughs> um, let, let me point out something I like what you were saying about the oil company it's pretty accurate but let me just add one dangling participle you could add to your little talk there you know you, you, you should always say and there's always a leak <laughs> that's a that's a i think that's a very important sentence that's often overlooked because we do this we do this but but no there's always a leak yeah and yeah, if, 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 yeah. And, 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 if, and if we spill we, we just get the broom out and sweep it up exactly <laughs> yeah yeah the, 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 those celery energy spills are wonderful aren't they yeah <laughs> <laughs> been living in one all my life um, <laughs> nope not right now you're not <laughs> not in london <laughs> <laughs> this is a downstream effect this is a downstream effect <laughs> yeah um and so yeah i yeah so, so yeah I, I think that's right and and even the refinery that we're developing our our like our our end goal is that the only waste product we have is some slightly salty water um that that that's that's really our our end goal um and so, you know, um, so I, yeah, I can't decide if, if I'm building the refinery or, or which analogy works better. I'm building the refinery or the sargassum is our buffalo. Right? Well, well the, the, the steal that water and think of something to do with the salts. I d d don't think I haven't been working on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that for a minute. I just wanted to sound smart for a chance. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, can we just leave water? Yeah, no, that that's that that is that is the idea. Um, yeah, so I mean, like I said, so, yeah, so we yeah we've developed a biostimulant. Um, we the the absorber that we have for agriculture is actually one of the things I'm almost, I'm 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 one of the things I'm really excited about because not only was it useful for agriculture, but we think we can we're we're on the roadmap to replace the plastics and diapers. Um, you know, that same absorber, Sweet. right? You can put it on a field, and you can throw it in a nappy. Um, you know, uh, and, and get rid of that and get rid of that, those plastics and that plastic waste. Um, you know, uh, you know, we've got, uh, and we have an insulating foam, um, and we have an, an aerogel, uh, that insulates as well as down, if not a little bit better. Um, so we're, we're looking at applications in, um, in fashion and, and, um, and even like an automotive, you know, so if we can, you know, add, add some insulate, you know, add the insulating panels in and make them lighter weight. And make them carbon negative. Um, we have a I want I want to touch some of your products. Yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're <laughs> what, what, what we have some samples. I'll, I'll I'll send I'll send you some samples. They're 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 really kind of fun. Um, they're uh, yeah, and uh, we and and that actually and the aerogel. If we make it a little bit tougher, um, we can make um, we can make a more of a spongy gel um, that we're looking at as like a input into um, uh, furniture um, and, and that sort of thing, uh, you know, as, a, as the padding and furniture. Um, we have a replacement for leather um, that's actually self-healing. Um, so if you scratch it, the, the, the scratch disappears as it all puts itself back together. It's a little weird to watch, but it does. Um, you know, and that's, and that's, just, the, that's just the stuff we've managed to, to do with the, um, you know, with the, with the, with the biostimulant, the alginate and a little bit of cellulose. Uh, so, you know, so our roadmap includes like, you know, we see applications obviously in medicine, uh, you know, including wound care, right? Those absorbers, like we can tune the absorbers and we can tune the absorption, right? So we can, we can make, we can make, uh, you know, bandages for different kinds of wounds. 
Um, you know, we've, there are pharmaceutical applications in the sulfated polysaccharides, you know, the fucoidins and that sort of thing. Um, there are, um, as well as cosmetic applications. Um, so we're, we're also, also some of our, our processing type, we've gotten some of the processing technologies so inexpensive that we, we, we see a roadmap out to replace plastics at like half the cost of, con of conventional bioplastics. Um, then there's the applications in the batteries and electronics um, that, that we've been talking about, nanotechnology. My, my, long my personal long-term roadmap includes supercapacitors built entirely from seaweed, um, as well as soft robots. <laughs> um, but that may just be my tech background. <laughs> please, uh, please do that while I'm still alive. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, li I'd like to see that too. Yeah, well, actually, the, the, the soft, actually, with, with, with some of the films that we, we've made, the soft robots may not be that far away. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, and, and so, you know, and so, so, so we think, uh, you know, to me, this is almost like the, the you know, this is, if, the, the analogy to oil actually isn't that far away, right? Because oil is, is the essential feed, base feedstock into our current industrial economy. Right, seaweed has the potential to be one of those core inputs into the future bioeconomy. Right, it, it. I mean, it can be one of the. It to me, it, it's a platform input. Um, you know that, that you can that, that depending on how you how you treat it, how you derive it, the species that you're working with, you know what that species gives you. Um, they're you know basically you know the the range of materials that we can create, the range of things that we'll be able to do in the next five years, is going to be. You know, it, 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 you know, we're going to look back on this and go, God, we didn't know anything, you know, <laughs> like what we were doing, we we're eating it. Why? Why would you eat it? <laughs> right. Um, you know, and, and then and then we're looking at it as a feedstock for microbial fermentation. Right. And once you get it in as a feedstock, once you find something that likes to eat it um, and make interesting products like bioplastics or milk proteins, um, mm -hmm. you know, then then that just opens up an entirely new world. Yeah. Which so, let, let's 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 actually make that. I want to to clarify that mm. the in a time where we're trying to create meatless burgers and chicken nuggets, instead of feeding those animals soy, which is so harmful for the environment, our feedstock made of sargassum could potentially be uh, behind the food that we eat in the future, and that's extremely exciting. You oh, you, go ahead, Mar. You, you, yeah, you, you de definitely need a lot of sargassum, right, to to do all those projects and products uh, that you that you see. But maybe the question that some people could have uh, is like, so there is a lot of sargassum in the ocean and landing and everywhere, like in the Caribbean, as we all know. And uh, you plan also to farm more uh, sargassum. So why why that? I mean, the people could ask, why do you need more sargassum if there is already a lot? Right. Um, well, I mean, let's be clear, the, the current wild blooms are going to keep us busy for a while. <laughs> um, you know, so, because you know, the initial estimates of the, is that the Atlantic sargassum belt is 20 megatons. We think that's a low estimate um, based on what we see beaching. You know, and based on you know, based on kind of you know the, the reports that we're getting from you know from from the from the ocean and, and what we've seen, we think that's probably a low estimate. Um, you know, we know that some of these rafts are over 20 meters deep, right? They're so deep that they actually form their own anoxic envi environment around them. Um, you know, and um, you know, and then that's actually one of the one of the big ecological impacts. We we're talking to a researcher at, at the University of Puerto Rico, and he was saying, look, these these rafts don't even have to make it to the shore to have an environmental impact. As they pass by a reef, the anoxic zone that they've created basically chokes out the reef as they pass by. Uh, you know, um, and so it's you know, so 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 we're going to be dealing with that for a long for, for a while. But but the, but to get to those scales, right? To get to the scales that we need to really have me you know, make this in a, a global industrial input. Yeah, we have to go beyond, you know, 20 megatons, 100 megatons. We need to get up into the gigaton range. And that's when we start thinking about, okay, can we, can we start farming? Um, and so, you know, um, you know, so we've, 
we think that there's, there's huge potential in sargassum, but like I said, I, and in other species. Um, there was a really interesting ARPA-E project um, that was done uh, a few years back. I don't know if you've heard of the, the possibility of sargassum pinching. I think right. Fran, Fran actually worked in that project. Oh, you worked at you worked on the, the sargassum ranching project. Um, yeah, last last year. Well, they weren't working on sargassum ranching again because they got a second um, RPE grant, and RPE actually wants them to look into using the sargassum that's there. So I think there was two RPE projects looking at sargassum ranching. One using um, infrastructures like lines which didn't get into right. second um, round. And then the project I was helping out with for a few months from Fearless Fund, um, yeah, is trying to do it um, in the ocean, similar to what we heard on the podcast with Victor using gyres and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so, so we're, we're excited about that, that potential. Um, and what we're seeing, what we're thinking is, you know, that would be interesting to explore in terms of how do we, yeah, how do we clean up, you know, the dead zones, right? So if we're talking about the Caribbean, you know, the Mississippi dead zone, right? Can can we can we like start, you know, gradually pushing our way into that, you know, by 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 putting sargassum ranches, you know, on the edges and moving our way in, you know, Jorge Jorge was talking earlier about the. Um, the oil platforms, right? The oil rigs, right? So but yeah, let, let's start ranching sargassum around the rigs, you know, and you have to ranch it. You can't, it's not farming, it's ranching. Because if you, if you don't corral it, it, it tends to wander off. Um, but, uh, you yeah, know, because, yeah, you know, the, the species, they, the species that we're working with anyway, you know, they're, they're, they're floating, they're pelagic. Um, but yeah, so, so, but what we think that, we think that there, there's huge potential in that. Um, and then, and then, and then the, the next generation after that will be open ocean upwelling. You know the, the you know based on the kind of the, the climate foundation, uh, the climate foundation model. But yeah, so, but yeah, no, we we know we need to get to gigatons. So you know we know we need to pull a a, a just because the sheer amount of carbon we need to pull out. But b because if we can turn this into an, a massive industrial feedstock, well, then we can use gigatons. So how do you going into that future vision of okay ranching sargassum and um, using it? How do you think this can impact uh, our efforts in terms of climate mitigation? Do you think it will be something uh, positive in the long term? And also, are you maybe planning on applying for the X Prize of Elon Musk that he recently? <laughs> I'll let Jorge just I'll let Jorge uh, get, get into the X Prize. Um, the, uh, but for, for, from my point of view, so one of the areas that we're most excited about, yeah, so but like I said, we've talked about, you know, doing this work that we're doing right now, right, shows that, you know, seaweed can be a, a primary input, you know, um, you know, and we know that seaweed pulls down carbon, we know it pulls it out of the ocean, we know it pulls it out of the air, it can provide habitat, right, we can deacidify the oceans, um, and then we think it can be a primary input into creating a healthy and prosperous society. So, you know, you can, you, you can grow seaweed anywhere you have a coast, you know, um, and you just need to find the right species, you know, find, find the species that are growing there now and, and grow, grow some more of those. Um, you know, and so we, you know, we, you know, so this is potentially, you know, there's the potential here for a global, a global movement, right? So to feed people, improve agriculture, you know, provide critical materials. Um, and then it's the climate impact beyond just the carbon that's in the seaweed that, well, that we are actually really, really, really excited about. Because for every kilo of plastic that we replace, that's four kilos of CO2 that doesn't get emitted, right? For every kilo of nitrous oxide that doesn't come off a farm field because we're holding fertilizer on the field, that's 200 kilos of CO2 right? that doesn't get equivalent, that doesn't get emitted, right? So, so those are the kinds of multiplier impacts that like, yeah, that, that get me up in the morning. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't get out of bed for less than 10,000 tons of CO2. Um, so. <laughs> well, 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 let me, let me throw a question out there at you because um, you mentioned the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and coming out of the Mississippi river, you know, that's a huge, huge river basin. A lot of farmland. Heck, that's the headwaters of the New River in Boone, North Carolina, on the eastern side of the Appalachians, dumps into the Gulf of Mexico um, on its route. And um, Boone, 
where I went to school at Appalachian State, gets its drinking water from the New River. And then it processes its sewage and puts that in, back into the river, the headwaters. And um, and one of my uh, professors up there, uh, Shay Tuber, environmental tox guy, uh, looking at sex changes in fish downstream from, uh, you know, endocrine disruptors and endocrine mimics and, and just endocrine being, you know, um, mm -hmm. dumped in via waste. And every city and town along the New River, the Ohio River, the Kanawha, the Missouri and the Mississippi, they all run into there. And every one of them does that same thing. And so there's a lot of petrochemicals from agriculture and, um, and um, uh, you know, emergent contaminants, uh, uh, estrogen mimics from uh, fertilizers, or not from herbicides and pesticides mm -hmm. and all this other stuff, all these, you know, and, and pharmaceuticals coming into this dead zone and just collecting there. And that's why everything's like it is. Um, if you're farming this stuff out of there, you know, there's a lot of arsenic in some of this out there in the, the deep waters, but how will you be removing these things? Will you be uh, trying to harvest these emerging contaminants and reuse them for something else or sequester them in some way? Or, or how are you going to deal with that? Or do you even know today? Yeah, that, that's, it, it's an issue that we'll need, to, we'll need to do some more research around. The arsenic issue is one we've already sort of dealt with, right? Sargassum naturally accumulates arsenic. And thanks to the Department of Defense for dumping 100,000 tons of arsenic chemical weapons in the Gulf, um, you know, we're, we're, we're now collecting it and we're, we're hoping, you know, someday just to return it to them. Um, the, uh, you know, just, just leave it outside of the Pentagon. Here, we found your arsenic. Um, but, the, uh, um, but, you know, but we're, we're, we're you know, but we, we've, we're, we've dealt with the arsenic problem. We know, we know how to process it out, you know, and we're, we're we know how to make it safe, um, you know, for, for disposal. Um, the, the other pollutants and that sort of thing, I mean, obviously there's a whole complex chemistry, you know, and ecology interaction around those um, that really we haven't kind of, we haven't dug into, but, but having said that, the sargassum that's out there now is floating in that water, right? I mean, it's probably not as, con it's not as concentrated as when it comes out the mouth of the city, but it's floating in that water. Um, and what we're seeing is that, is that the bacteria that, you know, the, 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 the the bacteria that you know the, the the biome the microbiome that's on the sargassum or in the water or the sargassum itself they're all breaking that stuff something's breaking that stuff down it's not we're not seeing it in the sargassum itself um you know so so yeah so so obviously but that's an area that yeah we're, we're gonna have to dig into that that's a better answer that the plants are breaking it down and turning it into something else and i i hope you continue to find that out yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, that, that's definitely something we'll need to dig into. I, I, will, I will add to, to what Jason had been saying about, you know, when we're talking about the future and what's next. And, you know, you mentioned the X Prize, um, where certainly what we can do falls within the requirements in terms of it's completely natural, doesn't require any land, doesn't require any additional resources, but what's already in nature. And it has a capacity to absorb in, in a specific scale, uh, one ton per day and reach a gigaton, uh, certainly throughout the, the, the lifetime of the project. Um, so it, but it is interesting. I think what it, what it talks about more, more, more interesting is that when there's gonna be a lot of people and there's already a lot of people throwing money at climate, um, either because of self-preservation, uh, either because they don't really know if, if we're actually, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, uh, there's always Mars, you know? Um, there's no alternative right now. So there's gonna be a lot of resources either because of self-preservation or because people know that their things have to change. Um, I think what's interesting right now when we, you know, when we say it's how will sargassum farming evolve, what are the benefits for climate change is that it, it is probably, and this is certainly a, the thesis by which we're operating at a time where a lot of redwood forests that were supposedly were gonna be holding carbon for, I don't know, a hundred years are being burned up by those <laughs> wildfires every 10 years. Um, the ocean is really the only place where we can develop large scale civilization enhancing um, CO2 sinking, period. Um, uh, I, I think philosophically also it speaks to what we do. There's been a fascinating book that I've been reading 
called Outlaw Ocean um, by, a, by a, a, a journalist called uh, Ian Urbina. Um, the ocean already is generating so much economic uh, resources for the world in an illegal and exploitative and sometimes dangerous way. So the ocean is already giving us a lot. It's just very invisible for the vast majority of people that don't know exactly what kind of fish they're eating. They don't know, <laughs> they don't know where, where everything is coming, how everything is moving, who's moving it. Um, so the ocean is, or, is already pretty much the operating system for civilization. It's always been. Uh, so when we look at what the what sargassum farming will evolve, it's, it's certainly within a larger vision that we want to be contributing to, which is what is the new type of infrastructure for the ocean where we can go away from the old models that are exploiting uh, the oceans and thus exploiting Earth. Um, but, but yeah, but that just offer a new type of, of relationship to the ocean. And I wanted to, I wanted to add to that, there's a, a quote from, from an amazing book by Anna Zing called The Mushroom at the End of the World. Um, and she says, uh, I have it here, Staying alive for every species requires livable collaborations. Without collaborations, we all die. Um, and I think that it's very clear for us at Sea Combinator that whatever systems, whatever infrastructure, whatever business models we create, whatever products we actually churn out, uh, ultimately have to mitigate climate collapse uh, by creating these new models of livable collaboration with the, with the ocean, with the planet. And I think that's a beautiful quote uh, to come to an end with our interview. It was super interesting to hear all your insights uh, from C Combinator and all your visions about how the future will look like, uh, hopefully with all this amazing range of products uh, created uh, from Sargassum and maybe ranching Sargassum and contributing to mitigate climate change. So thank you guys for all your efforts and for sharing this with us. We will share all the links uh, from your company and your projects uh, when we uh, put this podcast out. And yeah, have a nice day and hopefully hear from you soon as maybe the winners of the X Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Here's hoping. Thanks so much, guys. It was a great conversation. Really, really Thank enjoyed you. it. Oh, I love this. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want that to end. It was super interesting that we today we touched on like almost every aspect of sargassum. Like we went from the biolog biology to the economy to the social to the communities. We touched everything, and I, I thought that was that was really cool. Really yeah, nice. and I I learned so much. Like I learned that the Eastern Africa gets sargassum. I didn't know about that. I learned that some of these rafts are. 20 meters deep. I didn't know about that. I learned about all these different products you can make that I've never heard about. I don't know. My mind is just blown <laughs> by everything we heard today. Yeah, I, 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 I know some people with uh, the Kenya Fisheries Department. I want to make some calls. Yeah, what I, what, what I find really interesting is that they say um, it's a sign of uh, like a collapse. It's something we, we need to to see it as a fact. And from this, they just want to improve it and play with it, not to stop the phenomenon, like from the beginning, as some people would, would think it better, but they want to, to grow it and yeah, to grow to grow it and farm it actually, to 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 use all the potential of sargassum. Like, yeah, and, and grow it and farm it, but in a circular way and in a way of thinking about society and equality within society and thinking about other species and the ecosystem. And that's the really cool part that they're not going for the easy solution, but they're going for a system solution, which, wow, yes, hard yeah, to we do. Gotta... We, they're looking at the big, 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 big picture. And that's important. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the thing is um, about this, and, and um, I'm about to ask you, I'm build up to a question to ask you guys. And I'll, um, you know, they're farming this stuff. I mean, the, the Sargassum, the sea, Sargassum Sea is a very important ecosystem in and of itself. And it supports a myriad of uh, life, you know, just in itself. It's uh, it's a substrate, if you will, for um, 
um, uh, pelagic fishes and stuff that come and hang out there and get little things that, you know, feed off of things that's hide other smaller fishes that are eating. It's all kinds, of, it's just amazing, amazing thing. And it sounds like that um, not only with, with, with the ranching sargassum, that it could also potentially grow other fisheries as well by creating a, a larger type ecosystem in, in these other places. It's, you know, and and all this started because of climate change and all these, you know, um, these big mats peeling off and all because of all kinds of stuff. But my question to you is, is uh, there's a lot of problems with climate change. And this is the only one I can think of that can be harnessed for good. It, 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 are you guys aware of another one? Like, like something that came comes out of climate change that's a problem, but then could be turned into a solution. Well, we've we've had a lot of people on the start, the sal gags, the soap people, yeah. and, and and all, and there's a lot of people doing, and, and these folks they're doing some amazing stuff with this symptom of uh, climate change. And I, I don't know if it's an, another symptom of climate change because. Symptoms we're having right now, we we're talking about earlier in Texas. Holy cow, that's a pretty bad symptom. Can't really do anything with that. I can't see any kind of way to do anything with that and make things better. But these folks are talking about, well, this is a symptom of this thing. Let's let's yeah. let's do something with it and let's let's improve the world. I do think that sargassum is at the moment the only climate change symptom that by using it as a solution, meaning sequestering carbon through it, you can also have massive co-benefits in so many areas like fisheries, like um, food supply, like uh, products, uh, fertilizers, so the nutrient cycle, you, it has so many, like its impacts are so broad when you use it to mitigate climate change that I think this is really unique about sargassum. That's actually what got me excited about sargassum. Yeah, and you, you, go ahead. I was just going to say that I really like the metaphor they did with the oil companies, because basically what oil companies did was to take the CO2 that was sequestered and then create a portfolio of products that we've been using, therefore releasing CO2. And what they're trying to do is exactly the opposite. They try to, to have a portfolio of products that they can, can offer, and at the same time, they're sequestering CO2. So it's like reversing the whole industry into a different thing. So I thought that was... Brilliant. Yeah, and the thing is, so many times these solutions, like here, oh, we can destroy that wetland over there. We'll just build a new one. <laughs> really? Why mess up the one we got? You know, so, so many times the the solutions that humans come up with create bigger problems. Um, I don't think this was going to do that, and I'm just I'm, I was really happy to meet these folks with uh with this organization. Really okay, nice. I think that's it for today. We had a really nice interview and um, I'm looking forward to hearing what our listeners think about, about these ideas. Yeah, excellent. Well, well, well thank you all for being with us again today and all that. Don't forget to, you know, look down here and uh, check out our webpage, uh, yeah. see what we're doing, like and share, subscribe and, and, uh, just keep up with what we're doing because we're, we're doing this for you guys out there. And uh, and if you got some idea that you want to share with us, put it in the description below. And or uh, there's an email address right here. You can contact us at there too, and and let us hear from you because some of you, somebody out there, I know that somebody in their list of us has got a good idea that we need to share to deal with sargassum or, or climate change or something. And and we want to hear from you. We want to talk to you. And I'll. Um, that being said, we'll see you next week. I don't know who we're talking to next week, but it's going to be somebody just as awesome. And uh, look forward to seeing you then. And uh, y'all have a very wonderful, wonderful day.